In 1900, a popular music publisher, E. T. Paul, produced a music book that had a picture on the cover page announcing the dawn of the century. At the center of the picture is a goddess-like figure, the Angel of Progress, bearing the flag of the new century. She is gently preached on a wheel with wings symbolizing time. Her flight is taking her into the future. This glorification of machines and technology is even more marked in a picture which appeared on the pages of a trade magazine over a hundred years ago. It shows two magicians. The one at the top is Aladdin from the Orient who built a beautiful palace with his magical lamp. The one at the bottom is the modern mechanic who with his modern tools weaves a new magic like building bridges, ships, towers and high-rise buildings. These images offer us a triumphant account of the modern world. The history of industrialization thus becomes simply a story of development and the modern age appears as a wonderful time of technological progress. Before the Industrial Revolution When we talk of industrial production, we refer to factory production. When we talk of industrial workers, we mean factory workers. Histories of industrialization very often begin with the setting up of first factories. Before factories began in England and Europe, there was large-scale industrial production for an international market. Many historians now refer to this phase of industrialization as proto-industrialization. In the 17th and 18th centuries, merchants from the towns in Europe began moving to the countryside, supplying money to peasants and artisans, persuading them to produce for an international market. With the expansion of world trade, the demand for goods began growing. But merchants could not expand production within towns. This was because here urban crafts and trade guilds were powerful. These were associations of producers that trained craftspeople, maintained control over production, regulated competition and prices, and restricted the entry of new people into the trade. In the countryside, poor peasants and artisans began working for merchants. This was a time when open fields were disappearing and commons were being enclosed. Cottagers and poor peasants who had earlier depended on common lands for their survival had to now look for alternative sources of income. Many had tiny plots of land which could not provide work for all members of the household. So, when merchants came around and offered advances to produce good for them, peasant households eagerly agreed. Merchants were based in towns, but the work was done mostly in countryside. A merchant clothier would buy wool and carry it to the spinner. Then the yarn spun will be taken to the weavers, then fullers, and then to the dyers. The finishing will be sold in the international market. The earliest factories in England came up by the 1730s. In the late 18th century, the number of factories multiplied. The first symbol of the new era was cotton. In 1760, Britain was importing 2.5 million pounds of raw cotton to feed its cotton industry. By 1787, this import increased to 22 million pounds. This increase was linked to a number of changes within the process of production. A series of inventions in the 18th century increased the efficiency of each step of the production process. Carding, twisting and spinning and rolling. They enhanced the output per worker, enabling each worker to produce more, and they made possible the production of stronger threads. Then, Richard Arkwright created the cotton mill, 
Till this time, as you have seen, cloth production was spread all over the countryside and carried out with the village households. But now, the costly new machines could be bought, set up, and maintained in the mill. Within the mill, all the processes were brought together under one roof and management. This allowed a more careful supervision over the production process, a watch over quality and the regulation of labor, all of which had been difficult to do when the production was in the countryside. The Pace of Industrial Change First, the most dynamic industries in Britain were clearly cotton and metals, growing at a rapid pace. Cotton was a leading sector in the first phase of industrialization up to 1840s. After that, the iron and steel industry led the way. With the expansion of railways in England from the 1840s and in the colonies from 1860s, the demand for iron and steel increased rapidly. By 1873, Britain was exporting iron and steel worth about 77 million, double the value of its cotton export. Second, the new industries could not easily displace the traditional industries. Even at the end of the 19th century, less than 20% of the total workforce was employed in technologically advanced industrial sectors. Textiles was a dynamic sector, but a large portion of the output was produced not within factories, but outside within domestic units. Third, the pace of change in the traditional industries was not set by steam-powered cotton or metal industries. Seemingly ordinary and small innovations were the basis of growth in many non-mechanical -mechan sectors such as food processing, building, glasswork, tanning, furniture making and production of implements. Fourth, technological changes occurred slowly. They did not spread dramatically across the industrial landscape. New technology was expensive and merchants and industrialists were cautious about using it. The machines often broke down and repair was costly. They were not as effective as their inventors and manufacturers claimed. Consider the case of the steam engine. James Watt improved the steam engine produced by Newcomen and the new steam engine in 1781. His friend Matthew manufactured the new model, but for years he could, he could not find buyers. At the beginning of 19th century, there were no more than 321 steam engines all over England. Of these, 80 were in cotton industries, 9 in wool industries, and the rest in mining works and ironworks. Steam engines were not used in any of the other industries till much later in the century. So even the most powerful technology that enhanced the productivity of labor manifold was slow to be accepted by the industrialists. Historians now have come to increasingly recognize that typical work in the mid-19th century was not a machine operator but a traditional craftsperson and a laborer. The starving orphan seeking a second helping of cruel, the spinster wasting away in her tattered wedding dress, the stone-hearted miser plagued by the ghost of Christmas Carol. Do these characters feel familiar? If yes, it's because they are the work of Charles Dickens. More than a century ago, these remain recognizable figures from the work of Charles Dickens. You must have realized that his characters are usually found in worse situations. This is because Charles was brought up in the period of industrialization. He had lived a hard life in Victorian Britain. We will now learn about what happened in Victorian Britain during the age of industrialization. We will learn about the human labor at that time and also about the life of the workers. In Victorian Britain, there was no shortage of human labor. Poor peasants and wanderers moved to cities in large numbers for a job 
As you all know, plenty of labor, wages are low. The industrialists did not want to introduce machines that got rid of human labor and required large capital investment. In many industries, the demand for labor was seasonal. For instance, workers to meet their demand, bookbinders and printers. Catering to Christmas demand too needed extra hands before December. At the waterfront, winter was the time that ships were repaired and spruced up. In all such industries where production fluctuated with seasons, Industrialists usually preferred hand labor employing workers for the season. A range of products could be produced only with hand labor. But the demand the market often for goods with intricate designs and specific shapes. In mid 19th century, ten, for instance, 500 varied hammers were produced and 45 kinds of axes. In Victorian Britain, per classes, the aristocrat and the bourgeois preferred handmade products. Handmade products came to symbolize refinement and class. These products were better finished individually produced and carefully designed. Machine-made goods were for export to the colonies. In countries with labor shortage, industrialists were keen on using mechanical power so that need for human labor can be minimized. This was the case in 19th century America. Britain, however, had no problem hiring human hands. The abundance of labor in the market affected the lives of workers. As news of possible jobs traveled to the countryside, hundreds of people tramped to the cities for work. The actual possibility of getting a job depended on existing networks of friendship and kin relations. But not everyone had social connections. Many job seekers had to wait for weeks spending nights under bridges or in night shelters. After the busy season was over, the poor were on the streets again. Some returned to the countryside after the winter when the demand for labor in the rural areas opened up. Others looked for odd jobs which till the mid-19th century were difficult to find. Wages increased somewhat in the early 19th century, but they tell us little about the welfare of the workers. For instance, during the Napoleonic War, the real value of what the workers earned fell significantly. Till the mid-19th century, about 10% of the urban population were extremely poor. In periods of economic slump like the 1830s, the proportion of unemployed went up to anything between 35 and 75% in different regions. The fear of unemployment made workers hostile to the introduction of new technology. Spinning jenny speeded up the spinning process and reduced labor demand. By turning one single wheel, a worker could set in motion a number of spindles and spin several threads at the same time. Despite its success, weavers were angry that since Jenny could do the work of eight people, they would no longer be needed. Consequently, women who survived on hand spinning began attacking the new machines. This conflict over the introduction of the Jenny continued for a long time. 
After the 1840s, built-in activities intensified in the cities, opening up greater opportunities of employment. Roads were widened, new railway stations came up, railway lines were extended, tunnels dug, drainage and sewers laid, rivers and banks. The number of workers employed in the transport industry doubled in the 1840s and doubled again in the subsequent 30 years. Industrialization in the colonies Before the age of machine industries, silk and cotton goods from dominated the international market in textiles. Coarser cottons were produced in many countries, but the finer varieties often came from India. Armenian and Persian merchants took the goods from Punjab to Afghanistan, Eastern Persia and Central Asia. Wheels of fine textiles were carried on camel in the northwest frontier. A vibrant sea trade operated through the main pre-colonial ports. Surat on the Gujarat coast connected India to the Gulf and Red Sea ports. Hooghly in Bengal had trade links with Southeast Asian ports. Many Indian merchants had bankers were involved in production carrying goods and supplying exporters. At the port, the big shippers and export merchants had brokers who negotiated the price and bought goods from the supply merchants. By 1750s, the network controlled by Indian merchants was breaking down. The European companies gradually gained power and first captured the local markets. This resulted in a decline of the ports at Surat and Hubli. Exports from these ports fell dramatically and the local bankers slowly went bankrupt. While these ports were decayed, Bombay and Kolkata grew. This shift from the old ports to new ones was an indicator of the growth of colonial power. Trade through the new ports were controlled by European companies and was carried in European ships. What happened to weavers? The power of East India companies after 1760s did not lead to the decline in textile exports from India. The Indian fine textiles were in great demand in Europe. The French, Dutch, Portuguese as well as the local traders competed in the market to secure woven cloth. So the weavers and supply merchants bargained and sold it to the best buyer. The company officials continuously complained about the high price. However, once the East India Company established political power, it could declare a monopoly right to trade. It proceeded to develop a system of management and control that would eliminate competition, control costs and ensure regular supplies of cotton and silk goods. This it did through a series of steps. First, the company tried to remove the existing traders and brokers connected with the cloth trade and establish a more direct control over the weaver. It appointed a paid servant called the Gomasta to supervise weavers, collect supplies and examine the quality of cloth. Let's move on to the second step. Secondly. It prevented company weavers from dealing with other buyers. One way of doing this was through the system of advances. Once an order was placed, the weavers were given loans to purchase the raw material for their production. Those who took loans had to hand over the cloth they produced to the gomasta. As loans poured, and the demand for fine textiles expanded, weavers eagerly took the advances, hoping to earn more. Many weavers had small plots of land which they had earlier cultivated along with weaving, and the produce from this took care of their family needs. Now, they had to lease out the land and devote all their time to weaving. Weaving, in fact, required the labor of the entire family, with children and women all engaged in different stages of the process. Soon, however, in many weaving villages, there were reports of clashes between weavers and gomastas. Earlier, supply merchants had very often lived within the weaving villages and had a close relationship with the weavers looking after their needs and helping them in times of crisis. The new Gumastas were outsiders with no long-term social link with the village. 
they acted arrogantly marched into villages with sepoys and peons now let me brief you on what sepoys mean this is a word pronounced by british the word sipahi meaning indian soldier in the service of british they punished the weavers for delays in supply often tortured them the weavers lost the space to bargain for prices and sell to different buyers and the price they received from the company was miserably low and the loans they had accepted tied them to the company in many places in karnataka earlier known as karnatic and bengal weavers abandoned villages and migrated setting up looms in other villages where they had some family relation here weavers along with the village traders revolted opposing the company and its officials over time many weavers refused loans closed their workshops and took to agricultural labor In 1772, Henry Patullo, a company official, had ventured to say that the demand for Indian textiles could never reduce, since no other nation produced goods of the same quality. Sadly, by the beginning of the 19th century, we see the beginning of a long decline of textile exports from India. In 1811. Goods accounted for 33% of India's exports but by 1850 it was no more than 3%. Now you might be thinking why such a thing happened. Let me tell you. As we have discussed earlier that the British textiles had become self-sufficient and they did not need Indian textiles anymore. As a result, the importance of Indian textile had reduced. Cotton industries developed in England. Industrial groups began worrying about imports from other countries. They pressurized the government to impose import duties on cotton textiles so that Manchester goods could sell in Britain without facing any competition from outside. At the same time, industrialists persuaded the East India Company to sell British manufacturers in Indian markets as well. Exports of British cotton goods increased dramatically in the early 19th century. At the end of the 18th century, there had been virtually no import of cotton goods into India, but by 1850 Cotton goods were over 31% of the value of Indian imports and by the 1870s this figure was over 50%. Cotton weavers in India thus faced two problems at the same time. Their export market collapsed, the local market shrank being overloaded with Manchester imports produced by machines at lower cost. The imported cotton goods were so cheap that weavers could not easily compete with them. By the 1850s, reports from most weaving regions of India narrated stories of decline and remoteness. By the 1860s, weavers faced a new problem, that is, they could not get enough supply of raw cotton of good quality. When the American Civil War broke out and cotton supplies from the US were cut off, Britain turned to India. As raw cotton exports from India increased, the price of raw cotton shot up. Weavers in India were starved of supplies and forced to buy raw cotton at sky-high prices. In this situation, weaving could not sustain. Then By the end of the 19th century, weavers and other crafts people faced yet another problem. Factories in India began production, flooding the market with machine goods. Now how could you think weaving industries could possibly survive? Factories come up. The first cotton mill in Bombay came up in 1854. and it went into production 2 years later 
by 1862, four mills were at work with 94,000 spindles and 2,150 looms. Around the same time, jute mills came up in Bengal, the first being set up in 1855 and another one seven years later in 1862. In North India, the Elgin Mill was started in Kampur in the 1860s and a year later the first cotton mill of Ahmedabad was set up. By 1874, the first spinning and weaving mill of Madras began production. The Early Entrepreneurs The history of many business groups goes back to trade with China from the late 18th century. The British in India began exporting opium to China and took tea from China to England. Many Indians became junior players in this trade, providing finance, procuring supplies and shipping consignments. Having earned through trade, some of these businessmen had visions of developing industrial enterprises in India. In Bengal, Dwarkanath Tagore made his fortune in the China trade before he turned to industrial investment, setting up six joint stock companies in the 1830s and 1840s. Tagore's enterprises sank along with those of others in the wider business crisis of the 1840s. But later, in the 19th century, many of the China traders became successful industrialists. In Bombay, Parsis like Din Shah Petit and Jamsesh D. Tata, who built huge industrial empires in India, accumulated their initial wealth partly from exports to China and partly from raw material shipments to England. Seth Hukumchand, a Marwari businessman who set up the first Indian jute mill in Kolkata in 1970, also traded with China. Capital was accumulated through other trade networks. Some merchants from Madras traded with Burma, while others had links with the Middle East and East Africa. There were yet other commercial groups, but they were not directly involved in external trade. They operated within India, carrying goods from one place to another, banking money, transferring funds between cities, and financing traders. When opportunities of investment in industries opened up, many of them set up factories. As colonial control over Indian trade tightened, the space within which Indian merchants could function became increasingly limited. They were barred from trading with Europe in manufactured goods and had to export mostly raw materials and food grains like raw cotton opium, wheat and indigo required by the British. They were also gradually edged out of the shipping business. Till the First World War, European managing agencies in fact controlled a large sector of Indian industries. Three of the biggest ones were Bird Hailers & Co, Andrew Yule and Jardine Skinner & Co. These agencies mobilized capital, set up joint stock companies and managed them. In most instances, Indian financials provided the capital while the European agencies made all investment and business decisions. The European merchant industrialists had their own chambers of commerce which Indian businessmen were not allowed to join. The expansion of factories needed workers. Peasants and artisans who found no work in the villages went to industrial centers in search of work. Most of the workers in Bombay's cotton industries in 1911 came from district of Ratnagiri and district of Kanku. Most of the workers went back to their home in villages and cities during harvests and festivals. Getting jobs was difficult, even when mills were more and demands of workers increased. Industrialists usually appointed a jobber to get new workers. The jobber got people from villages and helped them settle in cities and gave them money in problems and crisis. Jobber was a person who had authority and power. He started demanding for money, gifts, for his favor and controlling lives of workers. In those days, the workers had 10 hours shift from 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. European managing agencies which dominated industrial production in India were interested in certain kinds of products. They established tea and coffee plantations 
acquiring land at cheap rates from the colonial government, and they invested in mining, indigo, and jute. Most of these were products required primarily for export trade and not for sale in India. Indian businessmen avoided competition with Manchester goods and the early cotton mills in India produced coarse cotton yarn rather than fabric. This was exported to China or used by Indian weavers. By the 1910s, there were many changes in the pattern of industrialization. Due to Swadeshi movement, nationalists urged people to boycott foreign cloth. Industrial groups organized themselves and pressured governments to increase tariff protection and grant other concessions. From 1906, yarn exports to China declined due to production of Chinese and Japanese mills flooding Chinese markets. Therefore, industrialists in India began shifting to cloth production. Cotton piece goods doubled between 1900 and 1912. Till World War I, industrial growth was slow as it created a dramatically new situation. Manchester imports to India declined as British mills were busy with war production. Suddenly, India had a vast home market to supply. Indian factories were called upon to supply war needs like jute bags, uniform cloth, tents, etc. New factories were set up and old ones ran multiple shifts. New workers were employed and the hours were extended. At this time, industrial production boomed. After this, Manchester could never recapture its position in the Indian market. The economy of Britain crumbled after the war, being unable to modernize and compete with the US, Germany and Japan. The cotton production collapsed and exports fell. In colonies, local industrialists gradually consolidated their position, replacing the foreign manufacturers and capturing the home market. Despite factories growing steadily after the war, large industries formed a small part of the economy. 67% were in Bengal and Bombay. Elsewhere, small-scale production predominated. 5% in 1911 and 10% in 1913 of the total labor force worked in registered factories. Remaining worked in small workshops and household units, often in alleys, bylanes, etc. In some cases, handicraft production expanded in the 20th century, even in the case of handloom sector. Cheap machine-made thread wiped out the spinning industry, but the weaves survived. Handloom production expanded steadily, almost trebled from 1900 to 1940. This was due to technological changes. Handicraft people took up new technology if it was cost efficient. So, by 1920s, weavers used looms with a fly shuttle. This increased production, sped it up and reduced labor demand. By 1941, over 35% of Indian handlooms had fly shuttles. In areas like Travancore, Madras, Mysore, Cochin, Bengal, etc., proportion was 70 to 80 percent. Such innovations helped weavers compete with the mill sector. Some weavers were better off than others in the competition. Some of them produced coarse cloth while others wore finer varieties. Coarser cloth was bought by the poor and its demand fluctuated violently. During famines, the poor could not afford to buy cloth. However, the rich could buy the finer cloth when the poor starved. Famines did not affect Banarasi or Baluchari sari sales. Mills could not imitate specialized weaves. Saris with woven borders or famous lungis and handkerchiefs of Madras could not be displaced by mills. Weavers and other craftspeople of this time did not exactly prosper. They lived hard lives and worked long hours. 
Often, entire household had to work at various stages of production process, but their life and labor was integral to the process of industrialization. When new products are produced, people have to be persuaded to buy them. They have to feel like using the product. So how is this done? One way in which new consumers are created is through advertisements. Advertisements make products appear desirable and necessary. They try to shape the minds of the people and create new needs. Today, we live in a world where advertisements surround us. But if we look back into history, we find that from the very beginning of the industrial age, advertisements have played a part in expanding the markets for products and in shaping a new consumer culture. Secondly, labels were used. When Man Manchester industrialists began selling cloth in India, they put labels on the cloth bundles. The labels were needed to make the place of manufacture and the name of the company familiar to the buyer. But labels did not only carry words and texts, they also carried images and were often very beautifully illustrated. Images of Indian gods and goddesses regularly appeared on these labels. It was as if the association with gods gave divine approval to the goods being sold. By the late 19th century, manufacturers were printing calendars to popularize their products. Unlike newspapers and magazines, calendars were used even by the people who could not read. They were hung in tea shops and in poor people's homes just as much as in offices and middle class apartments. And those who hung the calendars had to see the advertisements day after day throughout the year. In these calendars, once again, we see the figures of gods being used to sell the product. Like the images of gods, figures of important people of emperors and nawabs adorned advertisements and calendars. The message very often seemed to say, if you respect the royal figure, then respect this product. Or, when the product was being used by the kings or produced under royal command, its quality could not be questioned. When Indian manufacturers advertised, the nationalist message was clear and loud. If you care for the nation, then buy products that Indians produce. Advertisements became a vehicle of the National Swadeshi movement.